Thank you for watching today. I pray that today's message will empower you to use your voice, help change the way you think, and refresh your spirit. If you'd like to follow along with Pastor's Notes, scan the QR code right here on your screen. You can also find them on our app. Today, we're finishing The Power of God, a series on healing. There comes a time in our faith where we have to stop just listening and learning and start acting and practicing. Pastor Duane calls this releasing our faith. We're all redeemed from the curse of the law. That curse can be found in Deuteronomy. But Jesus came to redeem us from every sickness listed in the Bible, and even the ones not listed. He purchased it once and for all. It's time to use your power, the same power that lived in Jesus, to stand up and release your faith. Let's find out how. So Psalms 103, in verse 2, it really puts healing and forgiveness together, which you find all through the Bible. But God says that he forgives all our iniquities and he heals all of our diseases. Uh, Jesus put them together as well. In Luke chapter 5, the 17th verse, it says, Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town from Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So what's present to heal? The power of the Lord. And it's present to heal them. Now, what we're going to see as we look at this, at, at this story here is that them does not get healed. But the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now, somebody gets healed who was not one of them. And he tapped into that power. But it was available to them. And behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. But when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. So here's a guy who's on some sort of a mat, and there's four of his friends that are carrying him. And you may have heard me say this before, but you need at least four crazy faith friends. And this guy's friends were crazy enough to bring him to Jesus. And when they couldn't get in, they climb on the roof. They take the tiles off, get some ropes, and let the guy down in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, well, whose faith? Well, first the four guys had faith, right? I mean, if you didn't have any faith, you would not have brought the guy up on the roof. And the guy had faith. Because he's like, hey, I'm bad already. You drop me, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so the guy willing to be brought up on top, he had faith. Right? So he saw their faith. And it's interesting, you can see faith. You can see it. Because faith's an act. Faith is an act. See, When, when you've got faith, you do something. You expect something. So... They let him down right in front of Jesus, and Jesus saw their faith, and he said to the man, your sins are forgiven you. That's the best news anybody could ever hear. Amen. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemes? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or say, arise up and walk? So the question is, which is easier? To say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up and walk? Well, which one's easier to say? Well, honestly, in, in one sense, it's the same. Because it was going to cost Jesus the same to say your sins are forgiven as it was going to cost him to say, rise up and walk. Because in redemption, Jesus not only paid for our forgiveness, he also paid for our healing. In another sense, you could say it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because who can tell? Right? 
But when you say rise up and walk, how many you know you can tell? You can tell if they're rising up and they're walking or not. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go home. And he immediately rose up before them. He took up that in which he'd been lying and departed to his house, glorifying God. Now, when Jesus said to him, take up your, your bed and go home, the man did something. He did something. Remember, faith is an act. So his faith got him to go up on the roof and let them drop him down. But when Jesus said something, he did something. Faith has to have a point where you believe you receive and you act like you receive. There has to be that point. Now, in Galatians chapter 3, the 13th verse, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, and that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, notice it says that you have been redeemed from the curse of the law. Many of us don't even know what that means. Like, what's the curse of the law? Well, it is actually in Deuteronomy chapter 18, from the 15th verse all the way to the end of the chapter, which I believe is uh, 68 verses. There's a curse. And the Bible says Jesus redeemed you from that curse. Now, the curse comes when you do not fulfill all of the law. But Jesus redeemed you from it because he fulfilled the law. He fulfilled it for you and redeemed you from the curse. Now, some people say, well, that's just for the Jews that Jesus did that. But notice that it says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the on the non-Jewish people. So when Jesus redeemed you, he wasn't just redeeming Jewish people, he was redeeming non-Jewish people. That's you, that's me, right? Jesus fulfilled the law because you and I could not fulfill that law. So I want to give you just a few of the things that are mentioned in that curse that you're redeemed from. In Deuteronomy 28 and verse 20, it said, The Lord will send upon you cursing, confusion, rebuke, right? In all that you set your hand to do until you're destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings and when you have forsaken me. The Living Bible in this verse mentions vexation. Message Bible mentions wrath, seizures, confusion, panic, and dysentery. Verse 21 says, pestilences will cleave to you of which you cannot be healed. Incurable diseases, consumption or cancer, fever, infections. Verse 27 mentions boils, hemorrhoids, incurable diseases, itches, senility, insanity, blindness, fear, panic, tumors, and ulcers. Just some of the things you're redeemed from. Boils from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, malignant sores, which are incurable, perpetual plagues on you and your children. Now, just in case it didn't hit you, and every sickness and every plague which are not written in the book, so it's all of the sicknesses that are written, and then all of them that aren't. So if you've got all of them that are, and all of them that aren't, I mean, no, that's all of them. So there is nothing from a sickness, disease, confusion, insanity, from which Jesus did not redeem you and me. All right? So... If we're redeemed, that the blessing of Abraham might come on us. And again, we mentioned this morning, Jesus heals a woman because she's a daughter 
of Abraham. That's the reason he heals her. He says, healing is hers. She ought to be healed because she's a daughter of Abraham. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, says, if you be Christ, that's you, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. She ought to be healed. You ought to be healed. Notice, not just of that sickness she had, but every sickness that's written and every sickness that is not written. The devil always tries to tell us that what we have is the exception or that we are the exception, but it is not true. It goes on, again, uh, part of that curse, extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, serious and prolonged sicknesses will cling to you, but we've been redeemed. So I want you to just say this with me. Jesus is my redeemer. Jesus is my redeemer. And he redeemed me, he redeemed me. From, every from every sickness. I am blessed. I am blessed. Healing, belongs to me. Healing belongs to me. It's God's will, God's will. For, me to for me to be healed. I resist sickness I resist. in Jesus' name. Jesus. Sickness, sickness, you can't live in my body. You must go. I am redeemed. I'm the seed of Abraham. Blessing is mine. Healing is mine. Deliverance is mine. Health is mine. Jesus redeemed me, and I am blessed. I'm not cursed. I'm healthy, and I'm not sick in Jesus' name. Glory to God. You Now, healing is not just an extra. Healing is part of the atonement that Jesus purchased for you and for me. Isaiah 53 is, is, is the, the Old Testament picture. Now, we say it this way. Isaiah looks down a prophetic telescope, and he sees Jesus go to the cross. And he sees what Jesus does for you and for me. And he says, surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we have streamed him, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. By his stripes, we're healed. Now, when the King James uh, translators translated Isaiah 53, they put in Greece and sorrows. Those same words are translated different elsewhere, but I just want to give you some different translations of the exact same verse. Dr. Isaac Lesser, this is a, a Jewish translation. But only our diseases did he bear himself. In our pains, he carried the basic English translation. But it was our pains he took. And our diseases were put on him. While it seemed to, seemed to us as one diseased on whom God's punishment had come. The Ross translation says, Surely our sicknesses he carried. And as for our pains, he bare the burden of them. Moffat's translation says, the blows that fell on him have brought us healing. Another translation, we are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. Young's translation, by his bruises, there is healing for us. The Amplified translation the chastisement needful to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him. And with the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. Now, somebody could argue and say, well, different translators translate this all differently. But I think it's very interesting that the Holy Spirit himself gives us his translation. And you find it in the New Testament in Matthew's gospel, the 16th verse. It says, when evening had come, 
they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. He cast out the spirit with a word, and he healed all who were sick. Now, if you had been there, you would have been healed. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. I, I don't know of any theologian who would say Jesus did not take our sickness, excuse me, our sins. But in the same verses, it says that he took our sicknesses, that the bruises, that the wounds that Jesus received, that what they do is they purchased healing for us. The Bible magnifies God's willingness to heal, his compassion, his mercy. It's interesting today that what you will find is most people magnify his ability. They say, I know God can, but I just don't know if he wants to. But if you look at the Bible, what you will find is it is constantly magnifying his mercy, his compassion, his willingness. I believe that God would rather that we doubt his ability than his willingness, than his compassion, than his mercy. In Matthew chapter 20, in verse 29, it says, And they went out of Jericho, and a great multitude followed him. And behold, two men were sitting by the road. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet, and they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. And Jesus stood still, and he called them and said, What is it that you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, that we may receive our sight. So Jesus had compassion or mercy and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. I think it's interesting. I've never heard anybody say that his mercies passed away. In fact, the Bible says he is the father of mercies. That that mercy is not something that's just temporary, that mercy is for all generations. When the Gadarene demoniac comes to Jesus, this man is, wears no clothes. And he's cutting himself. He's living in the tombs. And he cries out day and night, running around screaming. But he runs and falls at Jesus' feet. And Jesus brings healing and deliverance to that man. And the man wanted to follow Jesus, and Jesus didn't permit him but said to him, go to your house, to your friends, and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had compassion or mercy on you. And he departed and began to proclaim and declare us all that Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Now, what we tend to think is that Jesus just automatically would heal every single person that came. Now, healing was available to every person. But Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth. And the Bible tells us in Mark's gospel, the sixth chapter, the fifth verse, it says, and he could do no mighty work there, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. So Jesus not wouldn't do anything. The Bible says that he could do no mighty work there. Now, we know this is God in the flesh. Acts 10, 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, went about doing good healing, healing. But yet he could do no mighty work there, and he marveled because of their unbelief. So what's that telling us? It's telling, telling us that, that we need to believe, all right? We need to believe. Now, what people often think is the reason someone doesn't receive healing is because they don't have faith. That's usually not the case, right? But the, what often happens is it's not just that they, don't, that they don't have faith, it's that they also have unbelief. Because the two can coexist, but the unbelief tends to cancel out the faith. In Mark's gospel, Jesus has come down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and there is a man who has brought his son who has seizures to Jesus' disciples. 
and the disciples minister to the boy, but there's no help. There's no deliverance. There's no healing. So Jesus comes down and says, what's going on? And the man said, teacher, I brought my son to you who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes with his teeth. He becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples, but they could not cast it out. They could not cast it out. And he answered and said to him, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and he wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So Jesus said to the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, since childhood. For often he throws him both in the, the fire and in the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. What this man is trying to do, he says, Jesus, if you can help us, help us. And he's basically saying, Jesus, you do everything. But Jesus won't take all the responsibility. Jesus said to the man, he said, if you can believe. See, so often we pray prayers like, Lord, if it be thy will. And whatever, you, whatever happens, we think, well, that's good. And I said this morning, that's a chicken prayer. That's what that is. That's a chicken prayer. Because it doesn't really, no matter what happens, you're covered. Right? Um, when Jesus' disciples could not cast the Spirit out, did that mean it was not God's will? No. Jesus said, how many things are possible? All things are possible. And, and I understand why people want to just say, well, whatever God wills. Because then there's no responsibility on us. It was just God. And, and it's not, it, it's not uh, how can we say it? it it's, a, it's a bummer to think, hey, I, didn't, I, I failed. I wasn't there. When Jesus' disciples could not bring healing, Jesus was not happy with them. You know? He was not happy with them. He wasn't like, well, that's just fine. He said, you bring him to me. Right? And he talks to the man. He said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And the man says, I do believe. Help thou my unbelief. So did the man have faith? But did he also have unbelief? See, and what often happens is the unbelief is pulling on one side. The faith is pulling on the other side. And they kind of cancel each other out. When Jesus went to Nazareth, Jesus could not do mighty works because of their unbelief. When, when the, the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah and tells him, look, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Your wife, who is old, is going to have a child. And he's like, hey, we're old. We've had, how's that going to work? And the angel said, he said, you'll be mute and not able to speak until these things take place because you did not believe the words which we will be fulfilled in their own time. I mean, the angel was like, you aren't even going to be able to talk. You ain't going to put no one belief out there. So sometimes there's faith, but we've had so much negative stuff. Now, the disciples, Jesus has already sent them out. They've come back and they said, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. But now, in this case, they didn't bring any healing. But notice what happened. When that boy sees Jesus, he falls down and has a seizure, right? And he's foaming. How many of you ever seen somebody have a seizure? It's scary. I mean, the head, their eyes roll back in their head. They're foaming at the mouth. A lot of times, they're, they're, they're shaking. And when the disciples saw that, they went, "Woo!" Now, when Jesus saw the same thing, Jesus wasn't moved, all right? And so often, you and I, we've heard so much, we've seen so much. Somebody tells you, oh, yeah, that, that you have that? Yeah, my, my, my aunt had that, and she died. Yeah. Come on. 
that. You know, you see a doctor, and uh, we love doctors. We're for doctors. But they tell you, well, there's just, it's incurable. There's nothing that can happen. This is just what's going to happen to you. You know, in two years, this is going to happen. In four years, this is going to happen. And in six years, this will be at where you're going to be at. And that's the way it is. And they're constantly giving you that, that natural information. But you've got to have some inside information. And that inside information has to literally consume you. That's why the Bible says back in Joshua 1 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. Day and night. You've got to fill yourself with the promises of God. And when Jesus saw the people running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, You deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of them, enter them no more. The spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, came out of him. He became like one dead, so that they said, He is dead. But Jesus took it by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. So, so Jesus brought healing in the situation where it appealed there wasn't going to be healing, where the disciples were unable to bring healing. Now, in Acts chapter 14, they come to the town of Lystra, and it says, and there they were preaching the gospel. And they were preaching the gospel there. What were they preaching? The gospel. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, crippled from his mother's womb, who had never walked. And the man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing he had faith to be healed. So this man, Paul's preaching the gospel. The man listens and gets faith to be healed. May I ask you, what was Paul preaching? The gospel. Which part of the gospel? He was preaching healing. Because faith comes by hearing. See, healing is part of the gospel. And Paul preaches the gospel. The man listens. And look, he receives faith to be healed. Paul looks at him and perceives he has faith to be healed. Does the man have faith? Does he have faith to be healed? Yes, he does. Is he healed yet? No. See, you can have faith to be healed and not be healed because you have to loose your faith. You have to release your faith. At some point, it's no longer, I'm going to be healed. At some point, it is, I believe now. At some point, it's not I'm going to be, it's I, I am. I am. Now, when you say I am, at that second, sometimes there's a manifestation. Sometimes there's not yet. The Bible in Romans chapter 4 talks about Abraham. How he didn't consider the things that were negative. He didn't consider his own body nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. But he considered God's promise. He just kept on considering. And the Bible says he became strong in faith. Because he didn't consider the negative. Because there were natural things that said this cannot happen. But he looked at God's promise. And when he did, he became strong in faith. So this man has faith to be healed, but he's not healed yet. At some point, he's got to release his faith. So Paul sees him, and he says, he's got the faith. He can see that, right? And he says with a loud voice, he says to that man, stand up straight on your feet. And that man begins to do what he could not do. And when he begins to do what in the natural he could not do, the power of God hits him. And he receives his healing. And the Bible says he leaped, and he walked. He leaped, and he walked. I believe it was last month. Uh, Andrew Womack was here on a Sunday night, just like this. There was a lady here in a wheelchair who had not walked in 25 years. Right. Andrew prayed for her. Chris was there with her and said, they ended up, I thought it was interesting. She said when she came in, she said, I'm going to walk out of there. She, Chris helped her get up, took a step, took another step, took another step, took another step. She was walking. She was walking. 
See, but she said, I'm going, to, I'm walking out of that place. All right. 25 years in a wheelchair. All right. But it was the same thing. She had to do something to release her faith. You have to do, begin to do what you couldn't do. And say, so, and he said, but what if I don't feel it right now? Jesus said this. He, he said, when you pray, believe you receive them, right? And you will have them. The Bible says, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Right? They will recover. James 5, pray the prayer of faith and the Lord will raise them up. If you don't see an instant manifestation, it doesn't matter. I mean, no, Abraham didn't see an instant manifestation. But he just kept on considering that promise. Consider that promise. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and disease among the people. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing. Part of the gospel, part of the gospel of the kingdom is that healing belongs to you, that Jesus redeemed you from the curse of of the law. You know, we've been talking about healing, but I want to end the message today by praying for you. Now, if you have sickness, you have disease, you have pain in your body, if it's possible, I want you to put your hand on that spot where you have pain in your body right now. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus carried our sicknesses and he took our pain. So we're going to rebuke those in Jesus' name and we're going to believe God for the healing power of God to flow into your body. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I come against every sickness, every disease, every pain, every demonic oppression on their bodies in the name of Jesus. And I bind you in Jesus' name. And I command you in Jesus' name, disease, sickness, pain, go from their bodies in Jesus' name. You have no right in their bodies. I command you to loose them. Go from them in the name of Jesus. And I loose the healing power of God to flow into your body from the top of your head to the soles of your feet to bring health, healing, restoration, soundness in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Now, if there's something you couldn't do, just begin to do it. Just however much you can, just begin to do it. Keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. The healing power of God is working in your body. You know, you may be watching today and you're not right with God. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus or you're away from God right now. And you say, Pastor, I really want to get back to God. I want to be right with God. I want to know I'm forgiven. I want to know I'm on my way to heaven. And the Bible says this, that whosoever, that's you, will call on the name of the Lord. That's what we're going to do the way the Bible shows us to. The verse says, will be saved. So I want to lead you in a prayer right now. And if you will pray this prayer from your heart, when we say amen, you're going to be right with God. You're going to be forgiven. You're going to be a part of the kingdom of God. So I want you to pray this out loud from your heart. Just say, oh God, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. And I believe he rose again. I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I hold nothing back. I turn my back on my old life. And I'm going to live for Jesus. And I thank you. You've heard my prayer that I'm forgiven. My past is gone, that I'm now a part of your family today and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer and you meant that prayer, you are right with God, right? I would love it if you would contact us. We want to be praying for you every day for the next month. Right? Also, we have a free book that we want to give you or you can download. Right? We'll send it to you or you can download that book, but we do need you to contact us. I want to thank you so much for being with us today. We love you. God bless you. And keep the switch of faith turned on. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Dwayne, you are making one of the best decisions of your life. We are so excited for you. Just as Pastor said, we'd love to send you a free copy of his book, Your New Life. Log on to walkingbyfaith.tv and have it mailed to you. Download it right there instantly, or you can find it on our app. It's absolutely free and a great resource for you to have. 
Walking by faith is changing lives all around the world with the truth of God's Word. If you'd like to become a partner with us, we have three easy ways you can give. One, text WBF Give to 1 888 364 Give. Two, visit walkingbyfaith.tv slash give. And three, click on the giving icon in our app. When you choose to sow a seed into the kingdom of God, that money might leave your hand, but the blessing that comes from it will stay with you for eternity. We would love to connect with you. Here at Walking by Faith, we believe in the power of prayer. We have people standing by ready to pray with you. Scan the code on your screen to send us a prayer request or visit walkingbyfaith.tv to chat with someone today. I pray that you stand up and release your faith this week. We'll see you again next time.